this is going to be the first of what I hope will be many Tartarian Tales with ArtofDino.com piecing it together. This is an idea I've had for a while. I always, in the books that I come across on archive.org and elsewhere, come across these stories that share a little bit about Tartaria and the people through different stories or whatever that have been passed on. And whether their accuracy is uh, totally accurate or not, it always sheds a little bit of light on how awesome they were and around the time a little bit about them because it seems like all their books were eviscerated. So we have to kind of take from other people's books of what they thought of Tartaria. So I'd like to share some stories from this book about St. David and uh, it's pretty amazing and it tells an interesting tale about Tartaria and St. David was around in the, like the 500s so I'm not sure if they later put an I on some of the stories or a one but either way he was supposedly around the 500 to 600s and um, this is a tale. Here we go. St. David, the most noble champion of Wales, after his departure from the Brazen Pillar, whereat the other champions of Christendom divided themselves severally to seek their foreign adventures, he achieved many memorable things, as well in Christendom, as in those nations that acknowledged no true God, which for this time I admit in that only discourse of what happened unto him among the Tartars, for he chanced to be in the Emperor of Tartary's court, a place very much honored with valorous knights, highly graced with a train of beautiful ladies, when the emperor upon a time ordained a solemn joust in tournament to be holden in honor of his birthday. To this tournament resorted, at the time appointed from all the borders of Tartary, the best and hardiest knights there remaining, in which honorable and princely exercise the noble knight St. David was appointed champion for the emperor, who was mounted upon a Morocco steed adorned with a rich comparison wrought by the curious work of Indian women, upon whose shield was set a golden griffin rampant in a field of blue. Against the Welsh champion came the Count Palatine, son and heir apparent to the Emperor of Tartary, brought in by twelve knights, richly furnished with the habiliments of honor, who paced three times about the lists before the Emperor and many ladies that were present, to behold the honorable tournament. Which being done, the twelve knights departed the lists, and the Count Palatine prepared himself to encounter with the Christian knight, being appointed chief champion for the day, who likewise, who, who likewise prepared himself, and at the trumpet's sound, by the herald's appointment, they rushed so fearfully against each other, that the ground seemed to shake under them, and the skies to resound, with the echoes of their mighty strokes. At the second race of the champions, St. David, had the worst and was constrained through the great strength of the Count Palatine to lean backward almost beside his saddle whereat the trumpets began to sound in sign of victory but yet the valiant Christian nothing dismayed with courage ran the third time against the Count, Count Palatine and by the violence of his strength he overthrew both horse and man whereby the Count's body was so extremely bruised with the fall of his horse that his heart's blood issued forth from his mouth and his vital spirit passed from the mansion of his breast so that he was forced to bid the world farewell. This fatal overthrow of the Count Palatine abashed the whole company, but especially the Tartar Emperor, who having no more sons but him, caused the list to be broken up, the knights to be unarmed, and the slain Count to be brought by four esquires into his palace, where after the armor was loosed from his body, and the Christian knight received in honor of his victory, the woeful emperor bathed his son's body with tears, which dropped like crystal pearls upon the congealed blood, and after many sad sighs, he breathed forth this woeful lamentation. Now are my triumphs turned into everlasting woes, from a pleasant pastime to a direful and bloody tragedy. O oh, most unkind fortune, never constant but changeable, why is my life deferred to see the downfall of my dear son, the noble Count Palatine? Why rends not this accursed earth whereon I stand, and presently swallow up my body into her hungry bowels? Is this the use of Christians, for true honor to repay dishonor? Could not base blood serve to stain his deadly hands withal, but the royal blood of my dear son, in whose revenge the face of the heavens is stained with blood, and cries for vengeance to the majesty of mighty Jove? The dreadful furies, the direful daughters of dark night, and all the baleful company of burning Acheron, whose loins shall be girt with serpents, and hair be hanged with wreaths of snakes, 
shall haunt, pursue, and follow that cursed Christian champion that hath bereaved my country Tartary of so precious a jewel as my dear son the Count Palatine was, whose magnanimous prowess did surpass all the knights of our realm. Thus sorrowed the woeful emperor for the death of his noble son, sometimes making the echoes of his lamentations pierce the elements, another while forcing his bitter curses to sink to the deep foundations of Acheron, one while intending to be revenged on St. David, the Christian champion, then presently his intent was crossed with a contrary imagining, thinking it was against the law of arms, in a great dishonor to his country, by violence to oppress a strange knight, whose actions had ever been guided by true honor, but yet at last this firm resolution entered his mind. There was adjoining upon the borders of Tartary an enchanted garden, kept by magic art, from whence never any returned that attempted to enter, the governor of which garden was a notable and famous necromancer named Ormandine, to which magician the Tartarian emperor intended to send the adventurous champion Saint David, thereby to revenge the Count Palatine's death. So the emperor, after some days were passed, in the obsequies of his son performed, caused the Christian knight to be brought into his presence, to whom he committed this heavy task and weary labor. Proud knight, said the angry emperor, thou knowest since thy arrival in our territories how highly I have honored thee, not only in granting thee liberty to live, but making thee my chief companion, which high honor thou hast repaid with great ingratitude and blemished true nobility in being the cause of my dear son's death for which unhappy deed thou rightly hast deserved death. But yet know, occurs Christian, that mercy harboreth in princely minds, and where honor sits enthroned, there justice is not too severe. Although thou hast deserved death, yet if thou wilt venture to the enchanted garden, and bring hither the magician's head, I grant thee not only life, but likewise the crown of Tartary after my decease, because I see thee hast a mind furnished with all princely thoughts, and adorned with true magnanimity. This heavy task and strange adventure not a little pleased the noble champion of Wales, whose mind ever thirsted after worthy adventures, and so, after some considerate, considerate thought, he replied in this manner, Most high and magnificent emperor, were this task which you enjoin on me as wonderful as the labors of Hercules, or as fearful as the enterprise which Jason made for the Golden Fleece, yet would I attempt to finish it and return with triumph to Tartary as the Macedonian monarch did to Babylon when he had conquered part of the wide world. Which words were no sooner ended, but the emperor bound him by his oath of knighthood, and by the love he bore to his native country, never to follow any other adventure, till he had performed his promise, which was to bring the magician Ormandine's head into Tartary, whereupon the emperor departed from the noble knight St. David, hoping never to see him return, but rather to hear of his utter confusion or everlasting imprisonment. Thus the valiant Christian champion, being bound to his promise, within three days prepared all necessaries in readiness for his departure, and so traveled westward till he approached within sight of the enchanted garden, the situation whereof somewhat daunted his valiant courage, for it was encompassed with a hedge of withered thorns and briars, which seemed continually to burn. Upon the top thereof sat a number of strange and deformed things, some in the likeness of night owls, which wondered at the presence of St. David some in the shape of Progne's transformation, foretelling his unfortunate success, and some like ravens, that with their harsh throats sounded forth hateful knells of woeful, tra woeful tragedies. The element which covered the enchanted garden seemed to be overspread with misty clouds, from whence continually shot flames of fire, as though the skies had been filled with blazing comets, which fearful spectacle, as it seemed the very pattern of hell, struck such a terror into the champion's heart, that twice he was in the mind to return without performing the adventure, but for his oath and honor of knighthood, which he had pawned for the accomplishment thereof, so laying his body on the cold earth, he made his humble petition to God, that in that his mind might never be oppressed with cowardice, nor his heart daunted with faint fears, till he had performed what the Tartar emperor had bound him to. The champion rose from the ground and with cheerful looks beheld the elements, which seemed in his conceit to smile at the enterprise, and to foreshow a lucky termination. So the noble knight St. David, with a valiant courage, went to the garden gate, by which stood a rock of stone overspread with moss, in which rock, by magic art, was enclosed a sword, nothing outwardly appearing but the hilt, which was the richest in his judgment that ever his eyes beheld, for the steel work was engraven very curiously, beset with jaspers and sapphire stones. The pommel was in the fashion of a globe, 
in the, of the purest silver that the mines of rich America brought forth. About the pommel was engraven with letters of gold the following lines. My magic spells remain most firmly bound, the world's strange wonder unknown by anyone, till that a knight within the north be found to pull this sword from out this rock of stone. Then ends my charms, my magic arts and all, by whose strong hand wise Ormandine must fall. These lines drove such a conceited imagination into the champion's mind that he supposed himself the northern knight by whom the necromancer should be conquered. Therefore, without any further delay, he put his hand into the hilt of the rich sword, thinking presently to pull it out from the enchanted rock of Ormandine. But no sooner did he attempt that vain enterprise, but his senses were overtaken with a sudden and heavy sleep, whereby he was forced to let go his hold, and to fall flat upon the ground, where his faculties were drowned in a real slumber, that it was as much impossible to recover himself from sleep as to pull the sun out of the firmament. The necromancer, by his magic skill, had intelligence of the champion's unfortunate success, who sent from the enchanted garden four spirits, in the similitude and likeness of four beautiful damsels, which wrapped the drowsy champion in a sheet of fine Arabian silk, and conveyed him into a cave, directly placed in the middle of the garden, where they laid him upon a bed, which was softer than the down of culvers, where those beautiful ladies, through the heart of the wicked Ormandine, continually kept him sleeping for the term of seven years. Thus was St. David's adventure crossed with a bad success whose day's travels was turned into a night's repose, whose night's repose was made a heavy sleep, which endured until seven years were finished, where we will leave the Welsh champion to the mercy of the necromancer, Ormandine, and return to the most noble and magnanimous champion, St. George, where we left him imprisoned in a soldan's court. What a story. I love it. So much can be inferred from this story regarding everything from there being a necromancer and a magical garden with spirits being a very apparent part of reality, the fact that the Tartarian Empire was clearly very well founded and very prestigious and powerful back in the time of 500, 600, so they must have been around a lot longer. Even the restraint shown by the king to not just kill St. David right away for killing his son, his only living heir, uh, that's pretty impressive to just honor the, um, the effects of championship and tournament hood like, to that degree. That shows um, that they were noble people, that they were good people. And which also makes you think like, wow, what happened to all their stories? Like, you know, I'm sure they wrote books, I'm sure they published, I'm sure they printed, I'm sure they etched on a lot of things and you know, what things in the past are, credit, are Tartarian that aren't credited to them and just how many things have they destroyed above all though just so many and it's it's absolutely ridiculous and uh, you know it talks about how big these empi this empire was and just uh, I can't even imagine but it's great to hear stories and tales from it so I hope you enjoyed this first episode of Tartarian Tales and uh, there will be more I found some other good ones that I'd like to uh, share with you as well and uh, share your comments. Let me know what you think. And if you can find any other stories, uh, bring them on. Let's all add to the uh, collective knowledge of Tartaria and restore it. And figure out at least what it was, good or bad. Let's just figure it out and no learn more about them. All right, bless you all. And if you get a chance, check out my site, www.artofdino.com. I know you all love my art, as well as my wife's, erinshelbybun.com. Bless you all so much. Have a great day. Tartaria.